This is a mechanism of disease map for encephalitis. I'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of encephalitis. And encephalitis is inflammation of the brain parenchyma. I recommend watching this video in conjunction with the meningitis video, which is an, in, which is an inflammation of the meninges, which are the membranes that surround the brain. And that'll help you differ, differentiate between meningitis and encephalitis. As in all of these flowcharts, each of the boxes is color-coded according to these core concepts that you see at the top right, and I'll be clearing each of these boxes and talking through them one by one. Let's go ahead and get started. The central pathophysiology for encephalitis, as I mentioned, is inflammation of the brain parenchyma. And as we work our way back to the etiologies, two large branch points appear. You can have infectious encephalitis, where the inflammation is caused by an infectious pathogen, and you can have autoimmune encephalitis, where the inflammation is mediated by autoimmune antibodies. We'll talk about infectious encephalitis first. Now, all types of pathogens can cause encephalitis. The most common is viral etiologies. So the viruses are gonna take up this top half of the etiology section. The most common virus to cause encephalitis are herpes viruses. This includes herpes simplex 1 and 2, varicella zoster virus, cytomegalovirus, and Epstein-Barr virus. Herpes simplex 1 and 2 are the most common causes of encephalitis, and herpes viruses as a whole are the most common family that cause infectious uh, encephalitis. Other viruses include enterovirus family, which includes Coxsackie virus, poliovirus, and echovirus. HIV can cause encephalitis. In that case, it's called HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder. The measles virus can also cause encephalitis, as well as the pretty um, grim sequela of measles infection, which is subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. This is a good reason to vaccinate against the measles virus. Rabies lysovirus can also cause encephalitis. It's called encephalitic rabies. There are also a handful, or more than a handful, maybe two handfuls of viruses that cause encephalitis that are mosquito-borne. So they are transmitted through mosquitoes, and there's nine or so here um, that can be transmitted that way. They include West Nile virus, Merle Valley virus, Japanese encephalitis virus, St. Louis encephalitis virus, tick-borne encephalitis virus, California encephalitis, Western equine encephalitis, Eastern equine encephalitis, and La Crosse encephalitis. So most common virus of all of these is herpes virus and HSV1 and 2 in particular that cause infectious encephalitis. Now less common are the bacterial etiologies, but they still happen. Treponema pallidum, you might know this as the agent that causes syphilis, can cause neurosyphilis, which has an encephalitis component. Borrelia burgdorferi can cause neuroborreliosis, Listeria can cause listeria encephalitis. Rickettsia rickettsi can cause, rock, can cause Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which has an encephalitis component as part of its syndrome. Ehrlichia can cause ehrlichiosis, which also has encephalitis in that disease. So less common, fungal and parasitic etiologies. The major fungus that causes encephalitis, although rare, is Cryptococcus neoformans, and the major parasite is Nigeria Fowlery. Nigeria Fowlery is a parasite that lives in warm or tepid, um, fresh bodies of water. This includes lakes and streams, so make sure you don't get water in your nose when you're in a lake or stream in a warm area. You want to avoid this brain-eating amoeba, Nigeria Fowlery. Next, let's turn our attention to autoimmune encephalitis. Autoimmune encephalitis can be broken down into causes that have an antibody against an intracellular antigen and those that have an antibody against a surface antigen. So in both cases, you're attacking the neurons, but you're either attacking the neurons from the inside, an intracellular antigen, or the neurons from the outside, a surface antigen. Those with an intracellular antigen are largely perineoplastic. That means that you have a concurrent cancerous or neoplastic disorder that is leading to the creation of these autoimmune antibodies. I've included a list here. Small cell lung cancer can predispose you to anti-who antibodies. Gynecologic and breast malignancies can predispose you to anti-yo antibodies. Hodgkin lymphoma can predispose you to anti-TR antibodies. Lymphomas, breast cancers, and lung cancers can predispose you to anti-amphiphysin antibodies. And lastly on this list, also an intracellular antigen is brainstem encephalitis, which contains the anti-re antibody. There are also a couple types of surface 
antigen autoantibodies that are worth knowing. Post herpes simplex encephalitis can predispose you to getting anti-NMDAR antibody. This is the NMDA receptor, it's a glutamate receptor, and it's possible that after you have a course of herpes encephalitis, as shown up here in bold and underline, you have a post herpetic simplex encephalitis syndrome where you have an autoimmune antibody mediated encephalitis. So you just suffered from infectious encephalitis and now you have autoimmune encephalitis through this pathway and the NMDAR antibody. Lastly is limbic encephalitis, which has a variety of antigens, or sorry, a variety of antibodies associated with it. Uh, you can have anti-AMPA, you can have anti-CASPER2, and anti-LGI1 antibodies associated with limbic encephalitis. So that's infectious encephalitis and autoimmune encephalitis, both of which cause inflammation in the brain parenchyma. Now let's turn our attention to the manifestations of encephalitis, and these are uh, pretty varied. Some of them are localized to the brain, some are neurologic, some are psychiatric, but there are also general manifestations that are worth knowing as well. Let's start with the nonspecific manifestations. These can be prodromal and can occur hours to days before the other symptoms, before the other manifestations of this disease. Brain inflammation can cause fever, can cause headache, and can cause nausea. All of those make sense. You can get fever and headache from the inflammation. Um, you can get nausea because it's your brain. Parts of your brain trigger nausea. Next are a bunch of neurologic manifestations. Some of these are just general neurologic manifestations, altered mental status, memory loss, seizures, and dysautonomia. Other neurologic manifestations are specifically from damage to a specific site of inflammation or infection in the brain. This includes hemiparesis, hyperreflexia, cranial nerve palsies, extrapyramidal symptoms, and language dysfunction like aphasia or dysarthria. For instance, if you've had damage or infection to Broca's area in the brain that might cause a language problem um, specifically. If you've had a problem in your uh, motor cortex, you might have hemiparesis and not be able to move a certain limb or a certain side of the body. Next are a number of psychiatric symptoms. Patients with encephalitis can have behavioral changes. This could be hypersexuality, hypomania, or agitation. They can also have hallucinations, anxiety, and psychoses. Lastly, a few notes on tests you might do to help with the diagnosis of encephalitis. All of these patients should get a brain scan with contrast. It's typically a brain MRI unless there are contraindications to MRI. If there are contraindications, then you'll do a CT scan, but you would always start with the brain MRI if possible. And the uh, results of the brain MRI kind of differ based on the type of encephalitis you have, based on the etiology. I've listed some of these examples here. Limbic encephalitis shows hypersensitivity in the medial temporal lobes. This is in the T2 flare procedure. Um, the herpes simplex encephalitis, remember this was the most common cause of infectious encephalitis, shows hyperintense temporal lobe lesions and signal abnormalities, also in the T2 slash flare sequence. Post-infectious encephalitis, that would be this one down here, the post-herpes simplex encephalitis, will show multifocal white matter lesions in that T2WI flare sequence. The EEG is also remarkable for herpes simplex encephalitis. This will show periodic lateralized epileptiform discharges from the affected temporal lobe. It is possible to get herpes virus encephalitis on both lobes, on both the left and the right, and in that case you would see this, uh, these discharges from both temporal lobes, both the left and right temporal lobes. This has been a short flowchart describing encephalitis. I hope it was helpful. And thank you for listening.